Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. The American Society of Transplantation and the Indian Society of Organ Transplantation are proud to present today's joint session on Evolving Biomarkers in Kidney Transplantation. In a moment, I will turn our session over to our moderators, Dr. Georgie Abraham and Dr. Darshana Dadhadia. But before we begin the main presentation, we do have a few housekeeping notes to help you engage with today's session. There is currently a viewership polling question displayed for the audience. Please take a moment to answer this question while we finish the remaining announcements. This webinar is being recorded and the archive will be available on the AST YouTube channel in two to three business days after the live session. Please note, all of your lines have been muted so that only the presenters can be heard clearly for the archive recording. If you have a question for our panelists during the Journal Club, we encourage you to participate by using the Q&A button in the Zoom webinar panel. Questions submitted via the chat window may be missed during the presentation. Finally, when you log off at the conclusion of today's Journal Club, you will see a link to a short evaluation survey to complete. Please fill out the survey link to help us keep our content current and engaging. Now, I'm proud to turn the session over to Dr. Georgie Abraham to begin our presentation. Good morning, distinguished colleagues from AST. I extend you a warm welcome on behalf of myself, Professor Vivek Kute, and the Indian Society of Transplantation. Um, and the MOU between AST and ISOT was signed a few months ago. And I'm extremely thankful that uh, Dr. Deepali Kumar and myself signed the contract with the help of uh, Brian, and we are going to take this forward. Distinguished colleagues and uh, delegates from India and abroad, and uh, we have this webinar on evolving biomarkers in kidney transplantation. Kidney transplantation is the most commonly performed transplant procedure in India. The first transplant was successfully performed at the Christian Medical College Hospital in Velour in 1971. And uh, that was a platform on which the Indian transplant grew. And uh, currently we are engaged in transplanting heart, lung, liver, kidneys, small intestine, pancreas, and bone marrow transplant in the hospital where I work. We have over 550 transplant centers across India. And some of them do only kidney transplant, the others do multi-organ transplants. So, and it's a matter of great pride for me to have this first webinar with the help of ASC. And I want to take this forward to a much higher level. Our Honorable Prime Minister, His Excellency, Mr. Narendra Modi, spoke about transplantation recently in his address to the country. And he said that we should take, make uh, major strides in transplantation as we are the most populous country in the world. And our kidney, chronic kidney disease prevalence is about 17.2. And majority of the kidney transplant patients belong to the diabetic group. And because we are the second largest diabetic kidney disease country in the world. So I, with this introduction, I extend a warm welcome to our uh, speakers, Darshana, uh, Alexander, John, and uh, Deepali is there. And I'm sure that this first webinar will be very useful and helpful for our continuing uh, mutual understanding and relationship to take this forward. Thank you. Thank you, Georgie. So many thanks to the leadership of Indian Society of Organ Transplantation and American Society of Transplantation for putting this conference together on evolving biomarkers in kidney transplantation. Next slide, please. These are our disclosures for today's presentation. Next slide, please. So the need for biomarkers to optimize the care of kidney transplant recipients is well established. Too little immunosuppression results in increased risk for de novo DSA and rejection, and too, mu uh, too much immunosuppression results in increased risk for infection and malignancies, both representing a significant threat for graft failure. Therapeutic drug monitoring is inadequate for identifying the right level of immunosuppression for any given patient. Next slide. In this review by uh, Nyssen et al., the authors highlight the critical steps for biomarker development. With the clinical need well established, the risks and benefits of implementing biomarkers in clinical practice have to be considered very carefully. 
As a result, the quality of the data uh, for biomarker qualification is very important. The author suggests that the minimum requirement for biomarker qualification include the use of locked models and thresholds, establishing clinical and analytical validity, as well as comparison to the standard of care diagnostics. This is particularly challenging in organ transplantation since the current standard of care, uh, a biopsy diagnosis, is also has its own pitfalls. Establishing the threshold for these biomarkers also requires careful consideration of the context of use. Next slide, please. In the clinical arena, I would suggest that we have a need for biomarkers in four different categories. We can have different biomarkers fulfill the different needs. The diagnostic biomarkers should be specific and accurate at the time of graft dysfunction and allow for the clinician to make a correct decision for clinical intervention. The prognostic biomarker should be specific and accurate at the time of graft dysfunction and allow for the clinician to make the correct decision for clinical intervention. Uh, I'm sorry, that should be consistent and reproducible during the course of clinical care and allow for clinical decision making where the risks and benefits of therapy are considered carefully. And the biomarker for surrogate endpoint must correlate with clinical endpoints to allow for all types of interventions and allow us to test novel therapies. So the surrogate endpoint should not change based on what type of therapy is used. The surveillance biomarker used for monitoring should be able to exclude pathology with high degree of certainty and have a reproducible normal range that is applicable to all patients, independent of age, sex, ethnicity, et cetera. Next slide, please. The Biomarkers Conference sponsored by the American Society of Transplantation in June of 2022, we asked several questions of the attendee, attendees. And amongst the transplant providers, the opinion on reproducible use of biomarkers. I'm sharing two questions from the survey that highlight what is important to the clinician. So what is a reasonable cost for a biomarker test? Great majority, more than 88% of the participants felt that the cost should be reasonable generally less than $500 per test. Second, what type of data are needed to implement the use of biomarkers into routine practice? So we received a response from 72% of the participants and majority felt that prospective multi-center investigations are required. Specifically, studies should demonstrate an association between the biomarker and the event of interest with subsequent intervention making an impact on clinical outcomes. So these are the points uh, that I wanted to put as an introduction to our session. And now, next slide, please. We have our two experts, Dr. Alex Weissman, who is the Executive Director of Kidney Transplant Unit at Advent Health Transplant Institute, and Dr. John Friedewald, Professor of Medicine Surgery, Medical Director of Kidney and Pancreas Transplant Program at Northwestern University, to present on this topic and share the data. Now I'll turn over to Dr. Alex Weissman. Thank you, Darshana. And uh, thanks to the audience and to the organizers. I think this is a, a wonderful opportunity for collaboration between ISOT and uh, the AST. Uh, next slide, please. So I think that uh, we've, I think Darshana really laid the groundwork for what we'll be discussing, which is the fact that our field is really in need of new tools and new technologies in order to improve our outcomes. I think that throughout uh, the last 30 years, we've improved in terms of immunosuppression management and monitoring uh, using our standards tools. However, what we really are faced with is protocol-driven management that is not personalized and really deviates our patient populations to the mean rather than to the extremes of improvement. So you can, basically this is the uh, uh, slide that, uh, that Dr. Freewald provided for us and I'm presenting uh, on his behalf. Between Scylla and Charybdis, I think we all face the dilemma of indiscriminate monitoring and indiscriminate management where we are looking for clinically evident rejection versus clinically evident infection too much or too little immunosuppression. Next slide. We have been called out as a field by uh, the celebrated writer, uh, the late Amy Silverstein in the New York Times article before she passed away as a two-time heart transplant uh, recipient. She chronicled her 
uh, struggles with the successes of heart transplant, but also the failures and the struggles that she had with side effect profiles and with a lack of development of new tools and technologies for uh, monitoring and managing her ongoing life with immunosuppression and with organ transplantation. Next slide. So what is our current status and where do we need to go? Well, on the left-hand side, you can see our standard tools, which are known to all of us, creatinine, urine testing, ultrasound, donor-specific antibody monitoring has become more routine, drug level monitoring, and of course, biopsy. Of course, all of these matters are late findings of early disease, creatinine and urine testing in particular are very lagging and non-specific markers of injury. We do not know the full extent of uh, every donor-specific antibody as a pathogenic entity. And of course, uh, we won't spend too much time on the biopsy uh, as the gold standard, but as Darshana uh, reflected, biopsies are subject to sampling error, interpreter variability, and limitations. Next slide. So where do biomarkers fit in? I think this slide very briefly depicts context of use, which I think is one of the most important concepts that we discuss as we speak of biomarkers. You can see in the middle of the slide, these are slides of patients' journeys through time uh, where they may have subclinical disease on the y-axis uh, evolving to clinical disease. You can see patients uh, starting out uh, we don't know what their prognosis will be. We don't know what their uh, course will be. They may have flirtings with subclinical disease. Some may uh, evolve to overt disease and ultimate failure. Same, some may evolve to overt disease and recovery. Some may flirt in and out of uh, clinical disease and subclinical disease, yet still have a, an excellent outcome, while others recover with essentially quiescence. So how can we actually predict and define this? I think that each phase of care deserves its uh, biomarker assessment. So we can, at the outset, assess future risk and susceptibility. Looking uh, at the subclinical realm and the monitoring realm, we hope to be able to use biomarkers to help in early diagnosis and non-invasive diagnosis of outcomes of interest. Once an outcome has occurred, we would like to use biomarkers to assign prognosis. And then finally, if, if we want, once an outcome has occurred, we would like to be able to use a biomarker for ongoing monitoring and management. Next slide. So our, what we'll be discussing today in the next uh, half an hour or so are the current biomarkers that are rel relatively available to us in clinical practice donor derived cell-free DNA, blood gene expression profiles, urine biomarkers, uh, and we will uh, not be discussing the molecular transcripts of the biopsy uh, for, for the purposes of today's lecture. So I will be spin, spending the next little bit just talking about where we stand with donor derived cell-free DNA. I think we've become more and more familiar with donor derived cell-free DNA uh, since its first uh, presentation via clinical uh, outcomes in 2017. Donor derived cell-free DNA is something that can be measured uh, readily in the blood. It's a reliable marker of endothelial cell injury. It can be elevated in a number of different uh, injury patterns, including rejection, infection, and drug-induced kidney injury. It's fairly dynamic and that it, it comes and goes rapidly with uh, injury patterns and is cleared uh, with a half-life of less than an hour. And typically, we now have a clinic, a three clinically available assays to be able to uh, measure and report upon uh, donor-derived cell-free DNA, either as a percent DNA over total cell-free DNA or as an absolute fraction. The three clinically available assays in the United States at this point are uh, the Alisher uh, test, the Prospera test, and the TRAC tests. And uh, the next slide, if you would advance, please, really describes the test characteristics of each of these donor-derived cell-free DNA platforms. While they all measure uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms in different manners, you can see across the top, the TRAC, the Alisher, the Prospera, you can see that generally speaking, the, the studies that led to uh, CMS oversight and uh, approval 
per se of these tests to be uh, utilized in clinical practice demonstrate sensitivity and specificity characteristics as you see uh, here in the slide. Sensitivity in the 60s percent range, prosperity a little bit higher in their, uh, in their data, specificity also in the 80% range. When you compare and try to fix the uh, studies to a given prevalence of rejection, and in this example is a 15% prevalence of rejection, this results in positive predictive values and negative predictive values of, being, of identifying or correlating with biopsy proven acute rejection a positive predictive value in the 40% range and a negative predictive value in the 90% range. How does this play out in terms of clinical utilization? I think is very important because our, our positive predictive value is what drives most of our clinical decision-making about action in a forecast setting. Our negative predictive value is quite important in terms of uh, being able to back away from interventions if we feel that that test is quite uh, successful in uh, identifying a quiescent state. Next slide. These data are just re uh, reflective of some of those initial studies that led to uh, these data that, that we see in clinical practice. Let's look at the DART study, which essentially demonstrates uh, from the left to the right on the uh, panel A, the percent of donor-derived cell-free DNA greater than 1% reflected by the above the blue arrow line. You can see chronic active antibody meter rejection, acute active antibody meter rejection, typically do have levels greater than 1%, although there are occasional measures below 1%. T cell meter rejection diagnosis, you can see is a little bit less uh, evident in terms of a 1% threshold. Many of the values are, are less than 1%. Uh, while it, then you look closely at the T cell mead rejection and compared to the quiescent state or the no rejection cohort. And you can see that, uh, that no rejection tends to significantly show a levels less than 1%, T cell mead rejection less than 1%, T cell mead rejection greater than 1B, showing a little bit more of a signal. So greater injury pattern leads to greater donor-derived cell-free DNA. Ultimately, the, uh, the conclusions could be that donor-derived cell-free DNAs are higher in antibody meter rejection than T-cell meter rejection with the medians demonstrated here. Another, uh, if, uh, next slide, please. The next uh, slide shows a similar portfolio from uh, the Prospera study, which a uh, Prospera test, which basically shows panel A, left to right, acute rejection, borderline rejection, other injury patterns and stable grafts correlated with donor-derived cell-free DNA. You can see again that acute rejection has a significant prevalence of uh, findings greater than 1%. Uh, but again, if you look across the line of 1% in the borderline, uh, other injury patterns and stable injury patterns, you can see that there are quite a few scenarios in which we see donor-derived cell-free DNA that are elevated above 1% in, uh, in a non-rejection scenario. So this leads to that reduced positive predictive value. You can see some of the, the criteria, the threshold with using a 1% cutoff, the median uh, donor-derived cell-free DNA was 2.3% in the rejection cohort versus the non-rejection cohort of 0.47. Next slide. Ultimately, we've evolved from these early preliminary data to single center experiences, looking again at the, the value of donor-derived cell-free DNA for the diagnosis of rejections. We're looking at it again as a diagnostic uh, early marker for uh, rejection. Meta-analyses of seven and nine studies demonstrated similar findings and that they did find that higher donor-derived cell-free DNA was found in those with antibody mediated rejection. But unfortunately, donor-derived cell-free DNA was not different between patients with T-cell mediated rejection and without rejection, leading to the conclusions such as it can be a helpful marker for the diagnosis of ABMR in those suspected of uh, renal dysfunction, so for cause renal dysfunction, but probably not for T-cell mediated rejection. Next slide. So I think we'll take, uh, uh, if you could advance through the points here, I think that in general, uh, 
a summary at this point looking at the diagnostic characteristics of donor drive cell free DNA is that it adds to our existing tools and that there is a greater association with antibody mutant rejection. There is a weaker predictive value with T cell mutant rejection. That, there, that with increased predictive value for rejection, this I think is going to be an important feature as we talk through some of what Dr. Friedwald will be speaking about. If you add other risk factors or add other diagnostic tests, such as donor-derived donor -derived cell free DNA plus de novo DSA, you may increase your predictive value. Uh, but again, context of use is very important. The pretest probability for rejection really influences this clinical utility of testing. The high negative predictive value is very reassuring and it may obviate the need for biopsy when we see patients in a stuttering uh, fashion with uh, creatinine or GFR changes that, that come and go and uh, make our clinical uh, care uh, a little bit more on, on edge. When we do see uh, patients with uh, high clinical suspicion, such as known DSA and rising uh, creatinine, perhaps the positive predictive value when we add uh, additional tools may justify treatment in patients who clearly just are unable to undergo biopsy for, for whatever reason. And I think at this point, from a diagnostic perspective, it is a complementary tool. Next slide. So I've, now I'd like to speak just a couple slides regarding other, ut uh, other uses or utilities of donor-derived cell-free DNA. And we'll speak first now, not as a diagnostic tool or as an early uh, uh, tool for uh, rejection, but now we'll talk about it as a predictive tool for uh, other outcomes of in interest. So the Admiral study was uh, published uh, last year. If you look, this is a, a, a visual abstract looking at the cohort over on the left-hand side of a thousand patients from seven transplant centers. Uh, you can see the methodology, but focusing specifically at the bottom of the methodology. The key here is it's three years of uh, surve surveillance with analysis of, of development of de, de novo DSA. GFR trajectories and allograft rejection. The top line descriptions of the outcomes are that if you have a donor derived cell free DNA greater than one result over 0.5%, it did correlate with a GFR decline from one to three years of a greater than 25% decline. There was a temporal relationship of donor derived cell free DNA uh, with the development of or uh, the risk of development of de novo DSA formation. And again, there was elevations of donor derived cell free DNA uh, during rejection ahead of changes in serum creatinine. I'd like to delve a little bit deeper into some in, into two of these findings just to describe context of use. So these are fairly dramatic slides, but in, uh, with some caveats. So I'd like to just point out that the risk of de novo DSA detection in those that had a donor-derived cell-free DNA less than 0.5 consistently versus greater than 0.5% uh, in blue. This represents, again, 1,000 patients screened, and there was a threefold increase of uh, de novo DSA formation in those with elevations detected by uh, donor-derived cell-free DNA. The absolute numbers of patients that developed de novo DSA were um, 12 in the um, non-elevated group and 32 in the um, elevated group. So this really um, points out one of the features of biomarker testing is that you have to do a lot of testing in a lot of patients in order to find correlations. Absolutely, it, it shows a correlation between uh, uh, donor-derived cell-free DNA elevations and outcomes. But the problem here is, is that it's not in every individual that has elevations. And the outcome of interest here is actually a quite small number. So we have to look at the number needed to treat in order to identify this correlation. On the right-hand side, the risk of EAGFR decline is interesting in that it clearly demonstrated a, a predictive feature looking at GFR from 12 to 36 months. Most of the tests were run in the first year, and actually the GFR decline was not correlated with outcomes in, uh, of donor-derived cell free DNA in the first year from zero to 12 months. So again, I think that it can be used as a predictive tool, but we have to keep in mind context of use and magnitude of use for what we're trying to prove on an individual level versus a population level. Next slide. <clears throat> 
Okay, last uh, little section that I will speak about is the use of donor drive cell free DNA as a prognostic tool. So after an event, what happens? Can you use the test as a uh, measure to predict the future? So this was a nice study that uh, involved uh, 11 transplant centers looking at 79 patients with TCMR1A or borderline rejection. Uh, and there was a mixture of surveillance and four cause biopsies that, uh, that, doc that documented the TCMR and borderline rejection. And these cases were stratified by levels of donor drive sulfonate greater than or less than 0.5%. And then the outcome of interest was to look at the change in GFR measured three to six months after the paired biopsy donor drive cell free DNA finding. Next slide. So as you see across the top, uh, you have low donor drive cell free DNA, less than 0.5%, 37 patients, and high, greater than 0.5%, 42 patients in this cohort of individuals who had been uh, diagnosed with borderline or 1A TCMR. So you can see bolded in the, in the dark uh, uh, black that the donor drive cell free DNA value by definition was less than 0.5, but the, me the median was 0.21. And by definition in the high cohort was greater than 0.5%, but the median was 1.4. These correlated with outcomes over the course of the coming six to, uh, three to six months and that the percent change in EF EGFR was eight milliliters per minute uh, decline in the high donor drive cell free DNA cohort versus negligible change in the low cohort. The presence of DSAs was correlated in the high versus the low, 40% had DSA versus 2.7. And recurrent rejection in the coming three to six months was 21% versus none in the uh, low donor drive cell free DNA cohort. So as a, as a prognostic tool, it seems to be somewhat helpful in, in predicting using a, a time of biopsy and a time of diagnosis test to look forward to what that what the time course or what the outcomes of that individual patient uh, could, could be. Next slide. So I would like to now turn the slides over to my colleague, Dr. John Friedwald, to uh, further discuss molecular transcripts and urinary biomarkers. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Alex. And uh, again, thanks everybody for being here um, and getting the two societies together. I think this is fantastic. I want to pick up uh, where Alex left off talking about some other types of technology, but also introducing a concept that I think we need to advance in the field of kidney transplantation. And that's the concept of detecting subclinical disease. And the reason for this is that, uh, as many of us know, we have pretty good therapies, not perfect, and I'll show you some data about that, but not perfect that areas because for T cell mediated rejection. But when we develop antibody-mediated rejection, we know that uh, we're sort of behind the eight ball. It's hard to treat and effectively uh, rid patients of that disease. And so we, we want to catch it early. And you know, I want to point out, this is not a new concept. The, the field of, of cancer uh, oncology has, has always way ahead of us in transplant, and they've sort of moved forward with this concept of detecting early disease, and obviously treating early disease is usually less comorbid than waiting for advanced disease. No one says wait for a very advanced breast cancer to treat it. You'd much rather catch an early stage breast cancer and manage it. So why don't we do this in transplant more? And I think not everyone, first of all, believed in the disease. Uh, the subclinical rejection is uh, was meaningful in terms of outcomes. I'm going to show you a number of studies that now suggest that it is. Um, and you know, I think this, this concept we have that the treatment is often worse than the cure we need to change that as well. We, we don't have to come in with one size fits all therapy. We don't have to give T cell depleting therapy to everybody with, with mild rejection we can actually uh, ideally adjust in maintenance immunosuppression to manage uh, alterations in, in uh, overall net immunosuppression. So how do we monitor for patients that seem fine? And, and many centers perform surveillance biopsies. And this is just an example of two patients, both with stable normal kidney function, one with a, a fairly normal biopsy and one with subclinical rejection. And so biopsies can tell us a lot about what's currently happening acutely and also what's happening chronically. And so we can gather a lot of information, but obviously biopsies are expensive, invasive and have, have risk. And so how do we get away from routinely biopsying patients to monitor the allograft? Um, what this shows is a series of studies, including uh, one I'm going to talk about, the CTOT-08 study, uh, that, that did just that. These are observational clinical trials that did surveillance biopsies to, number one, help develop biomarkers in the case of the CTOT-8 and the GOCAR study here, but also 
to sort of recognize the importance of subclinical inflammation and rejection on hard clinical endpoints. And all five of these clinical trials showed the same thing, that the, the association between subclinical rejection, even borderline rejection, and worse outcomes even by two years and worse graph survival by five years in the case of the GOCAR trial here. So at the end of the CTOT8 clinical trial, we developed a gene expression biomarker test to screen for subclinical rejection. And the way biomarkers, gene expression biomarkers are developed in this case is you develop two classes, this one, a group of patients that had subclinical rejection and a group of patients with normal biopsies. And we looked at differential gene expression in the blood using affiometrics arrays and eventually PCR-based tests. And you can look at all the entire exome, all 30,000 genes, and filter them through a bioinformatics process that asks the simple question, can we dilute this down to a set of genes that are either up or down regulated that can tell these two groups apart? In the case of the true graph gene expression profile, it was 120 genes shown here, and you can look at the heat map. And every new sample that comes in is compared to a standard locked classifier that sort of asks the question, the probability of either being more like subclinical rejection or more normal. And this, uh, so this gene expression classifier was trained on rejection versus the absence of rejection has now been validated in multiple cohorts, one being shown here. Um, and the key here is that, you know, you have to understand the context of use. How do we want to use this test? This test was designed specifically to avoid surveillance biopsies. What do we do with those kind of tests? We want a high negative predictive value. You want to know that if the test is negative, you can be fairly certain there's no rejection going on. Now, we set that threshold fairly high for the negative predictive value. Uh, the, the cost of doing that is that you have a lower positive predictive value in the 40 to 50% range. And you saw that with what Dr. Wiseman presented on the positive predictive value of self donor derived self free DNA. That's the same with gene expression profile uh, blood classifiers. And again, we have a disease that's not highly prevalent. The, the point prevalence of subclinical rejection on surveillance biopsies in the GOCAR trial, the CTAD8 trial, and others was right around 25%, with a total prevalence in two years of around 30%. So 30% of patients will have at least one episode of subclinical rejection, but at any point in time, it's around 25%. And so you're going to have uh, some false positives. Uh, again, when you have a gene expression profile looking for, for inflammatory genes, you can have false positive results with other episodes of inflammation, whether it's infections, systemic infections like COVID-19, et cetera. But you want a high negative predictive value to know that if it's negative, you can avoid safely avoid doing a surveillance biopsy. Um, gene expression profile, because it uh, can detect inflammation in the graft, also associates with outcomes. And Dr. Wiseman showed some uh, studies showing uh, prognostic use of biomarkers. Here's a, a study looking at the prognostic use of a gene expression profile. The group from the Mayo Clinic showed that if you had, uh, compared to having no positive tests over the first year, if you had one or more positive tests, you had a higher risk of graft failure and rejection over time um, when you have positive gene expression biomarker tests. So again, you can use these for the acute diagnosis or absence of rejection to avoid um, surveillance biopsies. You can also use serial testing to help you predict uh, the risk of someone going on to subsequent rejection or graft failure. Other groups have done this. This is this. This is the outcome from the GOCAR trial I mentioned. Exact same design. It was a two-year observational trial to develop a biomarker, and they came up with a 17 gene signature uh, for acute rejection diagnosis that was um, good at either ruling in or ruling out um, subclinical rejection in their patients. They also showed that uh, that uh, having early subclinical rejection uh, increased your risk of graft failure at five years, and that's shown in this lower figure here. So again, uh, as we follow these cohorts long-term, we can develop both acute diagnostic uses for biomarkers and also long-term prognostic use for the biomarkers. We then asked the question, can we combine biomarkers to do better? Um, and knowing that individual biomarkers are trained on different cohorts and have different properties. So by joining orthogonal technologies, can we improve on the diagnosis? And so what we did is we looked in a, in a group of stable patients with surveillance biopsies, and this is from the CTOT8 trial. We looked at the combination of the gene expression profile in the blood and the donor-derived self DNA in the blood here. So each of those is shown vertically in these columns, and the combined tests are shown here. And what we were able to demonstrate is that the both positive and negative predictive value in this cohort increased when we combine the two tests. And when we asked the question why, what we realized was the gene expression profile was detecting more cases of acute cellular rejection. And as Dr. Wiseman already pointed out, the donor-derived self free DNA is better detecting um, antibody-mediated rejection. And again, this was the first trial to show that 
the donor-derived cell free DNA can detect subclinical antibody-mediated rejection in stable patients with normal renal function. Moving on from the blood now to the urine, um, obviously urine is an attractive source for biomarkers because it's easy to obtain. Um, this is work from the uh, CTOT4 study looking at urine gene expression uh, for the diagnosis of acute cellular rejection. And, and what we found was that, yes, in fact, that you can detect uh, acute cellular rejection with high sensitivity and specificity looking at uh, gene expression in the urine. Um, and the, this is a lot of the work from the group at Cornell uh, going on to show here what I just mentioned about acute allograft rejection um, using these uh, three genes in the urine. Um, but beyond that, uh, you can use urine biomarkers for um, prognosis. So in this center panel, it shows that uh, patients that had rejection, if they had high levels of FOXP3 transcripts in the urine, that was a good, uh, a good, uh, a good prognostic uh, sign that they were had more reversible rejection versus those that had low levels of FOXP3 had less reversible cases of rejection. Um, one of the big problems we have with biomarkers is that there is the, the risk of having false positive biomarkers due to other uh, things like infections. Um, I'll show you in a minute with the urine chemokines, but even with the uh, with cell-free DNA and with gene expression profiles that can be confounded by other infections. And this is just some work showing that you can have a urinary signature that's very specific for BK virus nephropathy to help uh, distinguish it from cases of acute cellular rejection. Urine chemokines are attractive because, you know, urine uh, gene expression, you have to isolate urine uh, white blood cells you have to process them fairly rapidly and then preserve them to, to preserve the RNA for RNA expression. Urine chemokines are attractive because you can just use urine supernatant. Um, this is work from the original CTOT01 study, uh, Peter Heger and group, looking at the uh, urine chemokines CXCL9 and CXCL10, which tended to be fairly uh, good markers of acute rejection, both CXCL9 here on the left and CXCL10 on the right. Both of these were confounded again by infections in the urine. And so the caveat with urine chemokines is that you have to rule out other uh, urinary infections before, uh, before deciding whether you think there's a high risk for acute rejection. But again, these are easy to obtain and, and fairly cheap to run. Um, another group that's done a lot of work with urine chemokines is the group from Paris and France, looking at um, the use of uh, urine chemokines in conjunction with other markers. So this was a model that was developed uh, with urine chemokines for non-invasive diagnosis of, of rejection. And you can see over here, they looked at a number of factors, including GFR, proteinuria, donor-specific antibodies, uh, things like recipient age and gender, um, whether or not there was a common urinary tract infection, blood BK viral load, and then the urine chemokine levels. And what's shown here is the increasing uh, precision of this diagnostic tool when you, when you add these factors in and, and develop a, a multi-parameter model for the diagnosis of projection using urine chemokines with other, with other information. And so again, I, I think part of what we've learned with these different biomarkers over time is they all have their strengths and weaknesses. And uh, I think there are ways to potentially combine biomarkers to use to leverage their strengths and weaknesses to get a better and more accurate diagnosis of, of rejection and prognosis. So one of the big uh, one of the big interests and one of the things that uh, Darshana pointed out originally is that what do we want from a biomarker uh, based on the surveys? Well, we want a biomarker that's highly uh, accurate for the disease of interest. So can it diagnose rejection accurately? But also we want something that can then be used to intervene and improve outcomes because what's the good of a diagnostic if we can't use that then to take better care of our patients? What this shows, I'm going to show two studies now. The first is a CTOT9 study, which was a follow-up on the original CTOT1 study, where uh, this is again Peter Heger and colleagues looked at uh, the use of a urine chemokine to diagnose rejection. Now, this study was then saying, okay, we're going to use this urine chemokine to safely withdraw immune suppression in low-risk patients. So they started with low-risk patients. They withdrew to Crolimus, and that's shown here on the left side. Um, and you can see the time when patients were randomized here with the dark Xs, when they completed withdrawal with the green Xs. And unfortunately, a number of patients developed acute cellular rejection and de novo donor-specific antibodies shown by the blue and red uh, triangles here. Because of this, because of this high rate of rejection, the clinical trial was stopped early. Uh, due to safety concerns. Um, but, you know, what was found is when you go back and on the right-hand panel here, what was shown was when uh, when there was elevated uh, urine CXCL9, which is the biomarker used, and what was shown was that, in fact, the urine CXCL9 elevation did precede the episodes of rejection. So part of the question here is, you know, how do we 
not only use a biomarker for diagnosis, but how to be used in a timely fashion and effectively intervene to avoid uh, bad outcomes. The second is a more recent trial, and this was again using urine chemokines. This was using the other urine chemokine, CXCL10. This was a randomized trial using an intervention arm where they used uh, screening with urine CXCL10 at months one, three, and six. And if the, that was elevated, the patients were biopsied. And if there was rejection, rejection was treated. In the control arm, it was just observational. The patients went through their normal routine. Urine CXCL10 was collected, but not, uh, but, but not used. And unfortunately, this was a negative study. Uh, to summarize, the study showed really no difference between the two groups statistically over here. The intervention arm and the control arm had fairly similar rates of everything, clinical rejection, um, rejection on surveillance biopsies, Novo DSA, estimated GFR, et cetera. So unfortunately, the, the study did not demonstrate a beneficial effect of urine CXCL10 monitoring on one-year outcomes. Now, you might step back and say, well, then we shouldn't use biomarkers, but I would ar argue differently. You know, the trial didn't show a benefit, but was that the biomarker, actually uh, a subsequent analysis showed that the biomarker was very good at detecting episodes of rejection. So the biomarker did what, what it was supposed to do. The question is, was the study designed appropriately and do we have the right treatments to, to actually improve outcomes? So was it the biomarker or was it the treatment of rejection? And to follow up on that, um, the group from Canada, uh, led by Peter Nickerson and colleagues, showed that you know, this was a meta-analysis looking at multiple clinical trials that detected rejection and then did follow-up biopsies to show was the treatment of rejection successful. So this is looking at the effectiveness of T-cell-mediated rejection therapy. And there are a number of trials here, but what, but the, what the uh, aggregate shows is that roughly 40% of patients in these clinical trials who had T-cell-mediated rejection were treated and subsequently biopsied still had persistent rejection. So it suggests that we're not very good at treating T-cell mediated rejection yet. And that's important because if we design a trial where we use a biomarker or any other test to detect rejection, treat it and look at an outcome, if the outcomes are no different, we may blame the biomarker, but in fact, it may be that we're not using effective therapy to, to improve outcomes. And that's a really, uh, it's a challenge to our field to take these and now go the next step to develop effective therapies to really impact outcomes. This is more data, uh, similar data. This is from the CTID-8 trial where we, again, we looked at patients that had subclinical rejection, a sub, subgroup. They had every two week intense monitoring blood tests. And then we again biopsied them eight weeks later and we found the same thing. 52% of patients in this trial had persistent rejection. In this case, we looked at the, the blood gene expression biomarker and it was able to distinguish reasonably well patients with persistent rejection shown in the black line from those that had resolved rejection. And so we may be able to use follow-up uh, follow, follow uh, biomarkers to detect whether we're successfully treating patients. This would be called a theranostic biomarker to say, okay, we first detect detected a problem. Did we treat it successfully? Because if we didn't, we need to go back and consider either rebiopsying or retreating a patient. So I think the challenge to our field is the, you know, the rapidly evolving field of biomarkers, and they're coming at us pretty fast now and from a number of different directions, um, will allow you know, precision medicine. But it can be led astray if clinicians don't continually inform the data we get, the results of all the tests we have, to turn it into useful information that can help patients. Right? Any test in isolation is not very helpful. An elevated creatinine doesn't tell us what's wrong with a patient. An elevated creatinine in someone with severe dehydration or with uh, with you know, uh, obstructed ureter or with inflammation in a kidney graft, that gives us useful information we can then act upon to make the patient better. Um, and this principle is not new, but the allure of a new and easy test that results give us all the answers is really seductive. We'd love to have a test that tells us everything we need to know. But of course, that's why we still have a job uh, as physicians and clinicians and providers. We want to be able to take all this stream of data, put it together, and come up with a plan to help our patients. We must remember our value to patients remains being that link between the stream of constant data we get and the real clinical reality. And lastly, remember we're dealing with complex patients with complicated intersections of disease states that are near constant flux. Um, any, any marker of the immune system changes. I tell our patients and our trainees that the immune system is like the waves on an ocean and you can check it on any given day and it may be different, right? That just, we'd love to have a biomarker that we could measure in isolation, but the fact is our patients get infections, viral, bacterial infections. They don't take their medicine some days, they take it other days. And so any marker of, 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 of immune adequacy of immune suppression is to be put in the context of what's going on with our patients. So to summarize, and then we'll be happy to take some questions, multiple new non-invasive and invasive biomarkers are changing the paradigm of rejection diagnosis and immunosuppression management. Further refinement of the proper context of use, and it's really important to understand how a biomarker was developed, for what context of use, and to use it properly in that context of use.
And then the interpretation of the results will shape patient care as, as we move forward into the field of personalized medicine. We all want to get there. We all want to make individualized decisions for our patients with data that really reflects what's going on with them and not with the population. And I think, of course, the next big step is well-designed well -designed interventional clinical trials using the tools for the, for the development of the, you know, better interventions for our patients. And with that, I'll stop there and invite the rest of the panelists to rejoin and we can take some questions. Thank you very much for joining us and for your attention. Thank you, uh, Alice and John, for those excellent talks. Um, I wanted to begin this uh, Q&A session by first asking uh, Dr. Vivek Kute of, you know, what is the status in India? How do you use these biomarkers? Do you use these biomarkers? And what's the availability, even including donor-specific antibody testing? Is that readily available? And is it used uh, routinely in monitoring your patients? Yes, first uh, comment on the donor-specific antibody. Donor-specific antibody is freely available in India since more than 15 years. And we are doing in our hospital for each and every patient screening for donor-specific antibody in pre-transplant evaluation since more than uh, 15 years. Every year we do around 400 transplant. And this is done also in evaluation of disease donor transplant. In uh, some emerging centers, the cost is issue for use of donor-specific antibody. So they uh, do not uh, use freely before transplant, but after transplant, it is done when there is a clinical setting of AIM. Second uh, remark about the cell-free DNA. Uh, this test is recently available. Uh, cost is uh, the major concern. For example, the cost for the cell-free DNA in India is around four to 500 US dollar. I'm not sure what is the cost in USA, but it should be around 2,800 US dollar. So cost is the issue for using cell-free DNA, but uh, we have done cell-free DNA in few patients, but not in a large population. And third comment about the urinary biomarker, they are not available for clinical use in India. So probably this is an evolving field, just like DSA is now fairly standardized practice in majority of the transplant centers in India. In coming few years, we will be able to do a cell-free DNA uh, as a biomarker. Excellent. So um, we had a number of questions in the, uh, from the audience as well. And I'd like to start with this question from Dr. Agarwal. Can we take the, and this is aimed at John and Alex, uh, can we take the decision of anti-rejection therapy without a biopsy only based on donor-derived cell-free DNA, or I would say gene expression profiling for John? So maybe you both want to answer that question in the context of those two assays. Sure. Alex? I'm happy to speak about the donor-derived cell-free DNA. I think that uh, we're we're at a point where it, it does depend upon your clinical suspicion. It's almost like the, I, I really relate all of our biomarker tests to the analogy of utilization of a VQ scan for somebody who has hypoxia. You know, if you are willing to treat somebody with an intermediate probability VQ scan, then that is the analogy. I don't think I don't think we're there yet in terms of using it as a positive predictive value. You know, the positive predictive value is not to the degree of a CT angiogram for pulmonary embolism, for example. So that's that's my analogy in terms of positive predictive value on the suspicion side. Now, if you have a relatively low suspicion and you have a negative test or in like a normal VQ scan. If you have a low cell-free DNA test, less than 0.2%, et cetera, I think that you do feel quite comfortable in not treating. So I think that the decision to not treat is, is much stronger than the, the decision to treat. And I think that, that that, again, is about what your clinical context of use is and what your clinical suspicion is utilizing the test. Yeah, just before John uh, goes to answer that question, I wanna ask you on that point that you just made about not treating. So would you be comfortable not treating in the context of graft dysfunction and a low cell-free DNA value? How about in the setting of graft dysfunction with subclinical changes on a biopsy and a low cell-free DNA value? So speaking to the negative predictive value, how strong is your you know, um, confidence in that data? 
So, so you're saying, so the, the question is really now in somebody who has graph dysfunction, yeah. will, will it preclude trying to figure out the answer? Does don't derive self-free DNA solve the question of rejection versus non? I think that from a, just from the data as, as evolved as it is, I think that you can treat that as a, a value that will not, so if you have a low donor-derived cell-free DNA, you're not dealing with a, a 1A, 1B, or antibody immune rejection, but you very well could be dealing with a borderline circumstance. There are occasional individual circumstances. And I think that's where we really find the most trouble in our field right now is, is first diagnosing and understanding what these borderline changes are and what the prognostic uh, tendencies are of those borderline changes on biopsy and what interventions we have. So I think uh, Dr. Friedwald, John, you pointed Perfect. out exactly <laughs> the next phase, which is these biomarkers, I think if you take it, take it at face value and don't think about cost and you just treat it as a test to say, are we, are we better off having these tests than not? I think the answer is yes. But I think the answer is yes, because it allows us to inter it allows us to engage the patient and understand what the circumstances are and try to answer the questions that John was pointing out. Are we going to figure out what to do with subclinical rejection? Are we going to figure out a therapeutic intervention? It allows us to diagnose. It's going back to Amy Silverstein's desire of, of helping us make the next step, basically. Yep. And I'll, I'll pick up from there, um, absolutely. So the question really is, yes, how, how, how do we feel about treating? I would point out though, that there are, um, although different technologies may detect types of rejection better, there certainly is overlap. We saw a number of cases of mixed cellular and antibody mediated rejection where your therapy might be quite different than if it was a pure cellular or pure antibody. So I do think that right now, none of these biomarkers are good enough to with 100% certainty say, oh yes, this is a 1B mixed cell. Right. So I, I would caution people that these are tests to avoid interventions a lot of the time. They're tests to help manage patients, but part of that is informing the need for a biopsy. You know, what, what these tests can do though with negative predictive value is say, okay, rather than biopsying everybody, we can risk stratify patients and say, you know, at least half of our patients are more probably have stable tests and don't need invasive monitoring. But then you can do invasive monitoring with, the risk benefit ratio changes a lot because you have a higher likelihood of finding a problem when you do a biopsy and, and you still need a biopsy to be able to direct the, the type of therapy. Now, we might be able to follow up a biopsy with these test results. We might be able to do other things that we won't have to re-biopsy patients to make sure we've treated it exactly, but yeah. The other thing I'll say is that, yeah, that a lot of the challenge we have is, is in those borderline cases, right? Um, part of it is, and, and part of my big mantra now is, we often wait for such bad things to happen and then treatment's pretty bad, right? We give ATG, then they get CMV, then they get BK, right? And if we can make smaller course corrections on net immunosuppression, it'd be much safer for patients. So we do need to get in that uncomfortable space. A lot of people don't wanna go there, but that uncomfortable space of little bits of rejection, because I think unchecked that does that that fire burns on for a long time. And there's, there's evidence from both GOCAR and our trial to show that subclinical rejection ends up being persistent in a number of patients and that, leads to DSA development, all the things we want to avoid and are hard to treat. So um, I hope we can use these tools to get into that uncomfortable space and, and really figure out what to do with patients. I don't have all the answers to that clearly, but at least we have better tools now to get in there and, and figure it out. Let me ask a question related to the gene expression profiling, like a technical question. Uh, what is the day-to-day -day variability in the assay? And is it independent of the subtherapeutic or therapeutic levels of immunosuppressive therapies? Yeah. Um, so again, going back to what it, what they are, most of these genes are you know traditional inflammatory pathways, MHC presentation, T cell activation, et cetera. And so you know while they are specific for inflammation, they're not highly specific for kidney rejection, particularly in the blood. Um, and so that's why you have to take it with you know a po any positive test, you know isn't necessarily as highly predicted for for rejection. Now persistently positive tests are so right. We have transient inflammation, whether it's a quick viral infection. You know, but that's why repeated tests, and we've shown that repeated tests increase the positive predictive value if they're you know multiple positives. Um, so yes, it's it's challenging because again, on any given day, our patients can be taking their meds, missing their meds. You know, there are not there's so many different things interacting with the patient. Um, so that is a challenge. Okay. Um, 
Thank you. Um, I think uh, one of the other questions that uh, we have is, you know, related to infections. And so the question uh, from the audience uh, was related to the use of tenovirus and, you know, what is its role in monitoring um, TORC tenovirus yeah. at quantitative levels um, in monitoring patients? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I can I can start with that because um, it's a great inter interest of ours as well. So, you know, the nice thing is, okay, you've got a patient and they've got a low cell-free DNA, donor-derived cell-free DNA. They've got a negative gene expression profile. You've won, right? Well, maybe not. Maybe they're heavily over-immunosuppressed and they're about to get a terrible infection or, or, or malignancy. And we really have not adequately developed the other side of the coin, which is over-immunosuppression. And that's where viral monitoring comes in. And so a number of groups have, have started looking at virus monitoring for over-immunosuppression. The problem is many patients don't have CMV or BK in any given time. What's nice about torc tenovirus or TTV is it's a nearly ubiquitous virus. About 90% of, if you test a cohort of transplant patients, there's a very high prevalence of torc tenovirus. It's non-pathogenic as far as we know. I'm sure we'll eventually figure out what it does to our bodies, but it's nice because it's there and there's a wide range of viral load. So you can monitor this as potentially an immunostat. A lot of torque tenovirus, probably over immunosuppressed, not much under immunosuppressed. So I think a number of groups are looking at how do we measure it? How do we uh, calibrate it to help us figure out when someone is, you know, over immunosuppressed primarily? And I have a question related also to the point that you made about persistence of rejection, right? Um, following treatment. So is it because the biomarkers that we currently have are not getting at the mechanism of that rejection episode? And do we need different biomarkers for different mechanistic processes that are going on within the allograft? And how do we get there? Because so far as the presentations went on, the cell-free DNA could be diagnostic, could be prognostic, could predict graft outcomes. And similarly, we said about the uh, you know, gene expression biomarkers. So how do we get to the specificity of the process that's going on and you know, design studies that kind of validate such processes. I, I think the power, <laughs> that's where the power, well, that, that's where the power of gene expression comes in because, you know, sulfur DNA is just a thing. It's a marker. It's, it's got a number, but when you, when you can go back and look at differential gene expression, you can then map the differentially expressed genes to biologic pathways. And potentially those pathways can give us insight into not just the mechanistic mechanism, what's going on, but potential treatments. So yes, I'd love to see a day when we not only detect that someone's under immune suppressed and has immune activation, but in fact, that they may be more responsive to an mTOR inhibitor or a co-stimulatory blockade drug than a calcineurin inhibitor. So absolutely. I think the future is definitely there. The data are in the trees there. We have to, we have to design trials to dig through and find it. But I, I think that's certainly possible with the tools we have. And I think you yeah. both emphasized, and Alex, you may want to talk about the role of the cell-free DNA in conjunction with, right? That, that's exactly where I was going to go. Is I think that most most biomarkers are uh, additive and are complementary, and I think that our field is really at a point where uh, it would be ideal to be able to study multiple biomarkers in the setting of you know histology and then prognosis. So I think most of our struggles are at the level of how do we how do we know we've successfully treated somebody once we've once we've uh, identified a clinically apparent disease or how do we manage somebody who has a subclinical injury that doesn't fall to our criteria by standard you know lingo in you know histology of banff so i think that as we get more data with banff criteria and utilization of of uh, transcripts within the within the biopsies to help direct what's happening histologically. Then we uh, can correlate them with biomarkers and direct trials in a in a more efficient fashion. My guess, if I were to predict what John's thinking, is that we would love to have a diagnostic uh, parameter where we find you know buckets of patients who have you know subclinical injury and be able to stratify to standard of care optimization versus intervention versus you know something you know something in between such as uh, just overall monitoring first you have to decide how how much do the data show that we have subclinical inj injury that leads to to prognostic problems and then do we have the interventions and the tools to actually impact change and i think that ideally 
it will take multiple biomarkers. I know that our, our environment currently in the United States and probably in India as well from a financial and uh, management perspective doesn't uh, easily allow for multiple biomarkers at simultaneous times. And I think that that does tend to limit our, uh, our innovation and progress. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it gets back at the first question that, you know, we address the cost, you know, ideally, from a provider's perspective, we want it to be a cost effective scenario. Uh, and certainly from a global uh, medical care perspective, we want it to be a cost effective scenario. So we're at the top of the hour. Um, and I don't know, John, if you were going to share that slide that show the pathway, and if you could pinpoint where you think exactly we are with respect to biomarkers on the pathway. Yeah. Uh, you guys seeing that slide? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah so this is, this is, you know, a, a sort of a aspirational uh, pathway for biomarker development. And I think, you know, we certainly have gotten the first two. We've gotten prospective multicenter blind and independent evaluations. We have got lock thresholds and models and analytic validity. We're getting into multicenter validation for most of these, most of these tests. I think really the next big key is the comparison to the standard of care figuring out cost benefit, you know, where are these things priced, how often can we use them realistically in our patients, and then eventually getting to the next step of really impacting clinical practice and developing treatment guidelines and, and management guidelines for patients using these tools. Yes, I would agree. And uh, Alex, would you agree that's basically where we are between the multicenter and comparison of standard care? And the standard Absolutely. of care has yeah. its pitfalls, it's unfortunately. So, yep. well, uh, I'd like to thank everyone who joined. Um, our audience was very engaging. There were a number of questions that were posted on the Q&A, and we can try to answer them directly. Some of them were, were very specific to the studies, um, and so we'll share our responses to those. Um, and I'd like to thank the speakers for excellent uh, presentations uh, and insight into the use of biomarkers. Um, I would like to also thank Dr. Vivek Kute and Dr. Georgie Abraham for their um, engagement and um, involvement in this collaboration between AST and AIO, AIOST and the organizers for organizing this meeting. Thank you very much. Any last comments from Dr. Abraham or Dr. Kute? Yes, welcome to all of you for the Indian Society of Organ Transplantation meeting, 5 to 8 October at Kolkata, India. Thank you. All right, that closes our session. Thank you so much. AST would like to thank the Indian Society of Organ Transplantation, our panelists, and all of our attendees for today's session. Please look for an email from Zoom in about a week directing you to a copy of the recording available free and on demand. Finally, please remember to complete the evaluation survey in Zoom and visit myast.org education to learn more and register for our upcoming webinars. Thank you all again for today's excellent session.